Amen. We have such a great victory to celebrate, and we are going to celebrate it all out next week on Easter Sunday. Who's excited for that? As you know, I've challenged each and every one of you to invite at least one person to church for Easter. It's going to be a great day. And it's a day when regular people who aren't already believers will actually go to church just because there's still a lot of cultural pressure uh, to do that. And so I know God wants you to be a part of his plan to reach lost people. And that happens when you share the good news and invite people to come to church with you. Some of you have already done that. And you told me, hey, I invited a friend. He said no. But then later he texted me back and said, on second thought, I will go. Or maybe someone who said, you know, I have a family member and I've been praying for them to come to faith for years. I've been invited into the church hundreds of times and they finally said yes. God wants to use your invitation to change someone's eternity. Do you know that? And some of you are great inviters. You do it all the time. Others of you maybe feel timid or bashful. And you need a fresh dose of the Holy Spirit's boldness to do what God has called you to do. And so, hey, whatever campus you're at right now, Fountain Hills, South Mountain, Mesa, online, we're going to pray together today for uh, Easter Sunday and all the people who are going to be here. And we want to pray for hundreds of people to be saved next week. Amen. Some of those people will be your family members, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. And so we know some family trees are going to change forever out of this next Sunday. So let's pray together right now. Come on, join with me. Lord, we ask for your favor on us as we share the gospel and invite our friends and family to church. I pray for you to fill each and every one of your children up with boldness through the power of the Holy Spirit, the way that you filled Peter with boldness on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts. I pray that we would confidently extend invitation when you open the door and that we would believe for people to experience eternal life this next Sunday. Lord, be with us as we celebrate your victory. We want to give you all the glory and the honor next week. We want our church to be pleasing to you as we faithfully serve you. We thank you in advance for all the good that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, before we celebrate our victory next week, I think it's appropriate for us to remember Jesus' suffering this week. And so I'm going to talk about the cross. We know that sin is bad, but how bad? How bad really is it? I would say you can tell a lot about how bad a crime is based on the prescribed punishment for that crime. The punishment fits the crime. That's a phrase we use for a reason. And there's no worse punishment than that which Jesus endured on the cross. The passion of the Christ, maybe you saw the movie, the the word passion, it means the suffering Uh, the enduring, the bearing of the Christ, the suffering that he endured for us. That's what I want to focus on this week. And I think it's important that we focus on it in detail uh, every so often because we hear, you know, Jesus died on the cross for your sins or Jesus died on the cross for you. And and you can hear that so often but kind of lose a little bit of what it means. And so sometimes we need to focus on it and really appreciate what he went through for us. Jesus predicted his coming crucifixion at least six times in the gospel before it happened. In Mark 10, verse 33, Jesus said, Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. So you can imagine the disciples were probably really confused by this. They'd been following, for, following Jesus here. Things are going so well. After hundreds of years praying and waiting for a Messiah, here he is. He's healing the sick. He's feeding the hungry. He's casting out demons. He's walking on water. He's doing all these miracles. And you think, this is it. Our day of salvation has come. We're going to have this new kingdom of God ushered in, and it's going to be glorious. Then here's Jesus now, your Messiah, who you've long waited for, telling you, I'm going to die, and not just die, but in the most painful, humiliating way known to man at the time. We see a lot of crosses in culture today. There's crosses on our buildings. Some of you have gold crosses on chains on your neck right now. I think that's great. But you realize that the first about 400 years of Christianity, 
the cross was not the symbol of Christianity. Often there would be used a fish as a symbol, uh, an anchor, a dove, a ship, different types of things. Around 400 AD, Emperor Constantine popularized the use of the cross. It's called the Cairo, and he would put this on the shields of his soldiers as they went into battle. And then from this point forward, the cross became more prevalent in society. There you see an X, uh, that's the chi in Greek, and then that other shape, that's the row. These are the first two letters of Jesus' name in Greek, C-H, uh, the, the chi in the row there. And uh, that, by the way, is where we get the, the x miss. You see the abbreviation x miss. It's not meant to be disrespectful, but it's the Greek chi for Christ, miss. Their appearing with it is the alpha and omega symbol. And then, so at this point around 400 AD, the cross became a popular symbol of Christianity. The early Christians, they weren't putting crosses up in their places of worship because to them, it was a torture device. And they figured, you know, many thousands of people have been crucified but only one person rose again after crucifixion. The term excruciating literally means out of crucifying. Crucifixion was an excruciating way to die, a slow and painful death. Often people would be nailed to a cross and then left hanging there for days at a time, naked, physically mutilated, having already been tortured, usually low enough to the ground that animals could come and eat at the body while they were still alive. It was so terrible that in the brutal Roman Empire, they forbid Roman citizens to be crucified, which is why the Apostle Paul was beheaded instead, because he was a Roman citizen. Cicero, the Roman philosopher and statesman, said, it's the cruelest and most terrible punishment. And Josephus said, it's the most pitiable of deaths that a person can die, crucifixion. But I want you to think about that knowing before Jesus spoke the world into existence, he knew he was going to have to be crucified for us to redeem us. And he spoke us into existence anyway, having taken on human form and all the emotions and vulnerabilities and weaknesses that go with it, Jesus felt the weight and the stress of his impending suffering. The night that he was betrayed, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, and he experienced such stress and angst over his coming crucifixion that the Gospel of Luke reports he sweat blood. He actually sweat blood. And this is an actual thing called hematohydrosis, documented in medical journals. It still happens. It's a rare condition where a person is so stressed and they feel so much angst they're so worried or fearful that their actual blood vessels break and they sweat blood out of through their skin. And this is what happened to Jesus because he knew what was in store for him. The night of his betrayal, he was arrested, betrayed by Judas Iscariot, one of his own disciples, and then put through a mock trial with false witnesses testifying against him. Luke 22 then says, the guards in charge of Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and said, prophesy to us. Who hit you that time? And they hurled all sorts of terrible insults to him. So now Jesus is getting beaten. And this is the beginning of his physical suffering. We see it on TV all the time where people get in fist fights. And we see karate, you know, in movies and people fighting. And we don't, we don't really appreciate how violent fighting is. When grown men punch and kick each other in real life, stuff usually breaks. Like people get broken noses, broken facial bones, broken necks. People die just from getting punched all the time. People get concussions, obviously. So now Jesus is getting beaten, but you got to think about the fact that he was blindfolded as he was being struck and then mocked. Like, who, who hit you? Prophesy to us if you're this special prophet. Now, I've gotten in some fights in my day. You know, I was a rowdy young kid and did some combative stuff in the military. The worst punch I ever took in my entire life was a sucker punch. I walked into a room, out of nowhere from behind my peripheral vision, dude just came in and crack up upside the head. And I mean, I didn't have any awareness it was coming. It just hit me out of nowhere. 
No, and the thing is, when you get punched like that, when you can't see it coming, you can't brace for it, you can't do anything to absorb the impact or try to deflect it, you just take it all without any warning. It is so jarring and disorienting. And this is what happened to Jesus again and again, not knowing when the next hit would land. John 19 says, then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Now we think of people being whipped and we don't really appreciate how the Romans flogged people. They used what was called a flagrum. And it looked probably like this. It was multiple straps of leather with lead weights at the end and hooks or fish bones uh, or pieces of glass and metal uh, uh, wrapped in the leather straps. So we've seen movies maybe where someone's getting whipped with like an Indiana Jones looking type whip and it would sound kind of like a whoosh and then it would leave welts, maybe break the skin a little bit. The Roman flagrum was meant to be a torture device. We don't have any existing uh, in archeological evidence because over 2000 years, the leather had, would have been deteriorated. So they don't have an exact replica, but I found a guy who spent over a decade studying these, designing them, trying to recreate the Roman flagrum, testing it. And this was the design, and a lot of scholars think this is actually probably very accurate. You see there's a support brace to hold these strands apart. They're at different lengths so they don't hit each other, and it just stays an effective tool. We don't know how many straps would have actually been on it. It wasn't called a cat of nine tails, like you've heard people say sometimes. That's another thing that the British Navy developed for punishing their own soldiers and sailors. They didn't want to hurt their soldiers and sailors. They wanted to punish them and then tell them to get back to work. But the Romans used this as a torture device. It would have sounded more like slap, thud, and the the hooks would have stuck into the victim, and then they would rip that flesh out. So this, I wish you could feel the weight of this, but it would be more like getting clawed by a grizzly bear. I could tear through a sheetrock wall with this, no problem. It says this, their bodies were frightfully lacerated. Christian martyrs in Smyrna were so torn by the scourges that their veins were laid bare and the inner muscles, sinews, even entrails were exposed. So it was often times you'd see ribs and intestines exposed because of how much flesh would be torn away by the flagrum. And we see an image in the Passion of the Christ where Jesus is scourged this way with chunks of flesh just being ripped off his body And oftentimes, people died just from this. This beating was so severe, ripping chunks of flesh out, it would kill people all the time. That was very common. And Jesus went through this for us, lash after lash. You think about how severe that is. In Isaiah 53, it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his stripes we are healed. So his stripes, this word in Hebrew, it communicates a deep laceration, a deep bleeding gouge. Not like a red welt, like I got when I got spanked growing up, but a severe wound. This passage prophesies about the Messiah and what he would go through. And it's so specifically clear in articulating what Jesus actually went through. Do you realize that Jewish synagogues today still will often just skip over this chapter in their weekly reading? It's called the forbidden chapter in a lot of Jewish circles. In Matthew 27, it says that some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. And they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. So the soldiers decided to have some fun with Jesus. And he, it was said that he was the king of the Jews. Now, here they are mocking him in his supposed royalty full bore. They call the whole regiment out, a whole crowd of people like we have in the room today, just to stand around and laugh at him and mock him. They put a scarlet robe around him, purple, that scarlet color. That's the color of royalty in ancient times. So they were, they were mocking his royalty. They made a crown for him out of thorns and 
It would have looked like this. It was these Judean long thorns from maybe rose bushes that kind of just wove them into a circle, jammed it on his head. Here's your king's crown. And uh, they beat him with his mock scepter, the, the stick they put in his hand. They just beat him on the head with it again and again, the scripture said. Uh, then they cried out mockingly, hail, king of the Jews. Hail, king of the Jews. They did this again and again until they got tired of beating him. The very people who Jesus was dying for mocked him for his suffering. And, and many people still mock him today. Isaiah 52 says, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. If you grew up in Catholic church, you've probably seen crucifixes where there's like a white, pasty-looking Jesus on a cross, looking like he's just kind of sad, having a bad day with a little trickle of blood. In real life, he would have been ripped to shreds, hardly even recognizable as a man more resembling a piece of meat. Now think about this then. Jesus was forced to carry his own cross to Golgotha, a hill outside of the city of Jerusalem. And here Jesus was at this time. He was 33 years old, which is usually about the peak of physical fitness for a man. He was a physical laborer. So you've probably seen some images of Jesus where he's like, skinny and hippie and kind of like, art, you know, artsy-fartsy and soft-spoken. And like in real life, Jesus would have been muscular, manly man, was used to working with his hands, swinging a hammer, physically fit, but he was so beat, he was so weak from the torture he had already gone through that he couldn't even carry his cross. They had to recruit a bystander to carry the cross the rest of the way for him to the hill of Golgotha. And then they took these long nails and drove them through his hands and feet. They have uh, recreated these nails today based on archaeological evidence. It would have looked something like this. There are two heads there that was meant to keep it from going in all the way so the soldiers could pull it out afterwards. Easier to get the person down from the cross, and then they would straighten the nails out and reuse them again and again. These nails would have been driven into Jesus' hands, either in his palm or probably more likely in his wrist somewhere. Probably his arm was tied to the cross, and then this would have been driven in somewhere in this region. This would all been referred to as the hand in ancient language. So imagine just having this driven through your palm, your wrist, how painful that would have been by itself. Also into his feet. And there's been archaeological evidence recovered on the right here. There's a, this is an actual uh, heel bone from ancient times, from a person who was crucified. And there's not a lot of evidence. You can see how much of it has deteriorated over 2,000 years, but this is an actual uh, nail that was put through someone's ankle bone, so more up in the ankle region than down in the soft, fleshy part of the foot to hold the person to the cross. They usually had a type of seat affixed to the cross. They could sit on like a peg or a seat and that would support their weight up there on the cross, holding the victim there elevated, naked, to be mocked and to suffer. Matthew 27 says, after they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. This fulfilled the prophecy in Psalm 22 that said that Jesus' garments would be divided by those who cast lots. Picture Jesus on the cross, hanging there, suffering, bleeding, in agony, stripped naked to magnify his humiliation, with people laughing at him and mocking him. As he is taking on in this moment the sins of the world. Here is a, the only perfect man who was sinless and without blemish, without fault, who was dying for my sins and your sins in the moment. This actually happened. Do you realize that? This actually happened. Jesus hung there being punished for our sins. People laughed at him. The timeline would have been like this. About 6 a.m. is when Jesus was sentenced by Pilate. Then at 9 a.m. the crucifixion began. At noon, the Bible says darkness covered the land. There was like a type of solar eclipse. And then at 3 p.m., Jesus finally died. And at 3 p.m., this would have corresponded with when the temple sacrifices were being offered 
by the Jewish high priest for the forgiveness of sins. They didn't realize that out on Golgotha, the Lamb of God was being offered for the final sacrifice of sin, for sin. Jesus hung on the cross then for about six hours in agony, being cursed and mocked. Matthew 27 says, about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me or abandoned me? And this was the worst part of his excruciating experience. It wasn't the physical pain that he went through, although I think it's safe to say he went through worse physical pain than any of us have even come close to ever imagining. But then this was worse because you have to realize Jesus has been in the presence of God and in fellowship with God from begin before all eternity. And this was the first time in all eternity that the father turned his face from the son. He was cut off from the father in this moment and he cried out in agony when God turned away from him, experiencing that separation so that we wouldn't have to. Jesus hangs there on the cross, suffering and experiencing torment like we've never experienced. And and I want you to think about this. You have never in your life been completely cut off from God. Even when you were a sinner and lost in sin, you were still living in what theologians call the common grace of God. In a world that is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And so we, even as sinners, experience in many ways, the goodness of God on a beautiful day or through good food or through a loving embrace. But on the cross, Jesus was completely cut off from God, which is what will happen to people who spend eternity in hell. Hell is a place where people are completely cut off from God forever. We'll use this phrase like, I went through hell or today was hell. When in reality, none of us have ever experienced anything even remotely close to what hell will be like. One author I read this week said, if you could even fathom a fraction of what hell would actually be like, you would throw up. Even in our worst pain as Christians, we have the comfort of the Holy Spirit for our souls. But those in hell have no comfort because comfort only comes from fellowship with God and God does not fellowship with those in hell. It's a place for the devil and his demons and those who follow them in rebellion against the Lord. This is what Jesus endured on the cross. He literally went through hell for us. He was cursed. This is what it means to be cursed or condemned. Galatians 3.13 says, but Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, He took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. That's a reference to Deuteronomy 21. Our failure, my failure, your failure to obey God's standard established by the law, the standard of God's righteousness, results in justified condemnation for us. You might think, you know, I'm a good person, or I'm not that bad of a sinner. In reality, breaking even one of God's laws means you are justifiably condemned to spend eternity away from God. And on the cross, when Jesus hung there, he took on our curse so that we would not have to endure it. Many Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah even after reports of his resurrection because they knew he had been crucified and they knew the reference from Deuteronomy 21 that said, cursed is the one who is hung on a tree. They thought, how could the Messiah have been cursed by God, hung on the cross, on a tree? And they didn't understand what Jesus was doing. He was becoming the curse so that we wouldn't have to experience it. That's why 1 Corinthians says, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. You think about how often, you'll you'll even hear today, lost people mocking the crucifixion of Jesus. Like, well, how could God be this loving father if he would crucify, punish his own son? Or what kind of hero is killed on a cross? If Jesus is really so great, why did he do that? Why didn't he come in glory with power? The horror of the cross reveals the power of God. 
See, in the death of Jesus, in the suffering of Jesus, the Son of God, he did what only God could do. He redeemed a sinful humanity from the curse of sin by dying for us in order to save us. Matthew 27 says about 3 p.m. That's when Jesus shouted again and he released his spirit. This is when, according to the other gospels, he would have said, it is finished. And he, at this point, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and he died. We know scriptures say that a Roman soldier stabbed a spear through his heart to make sure he was dead, but he was already dead at that point. And I want to make sure today that you don't just appreciate the horror of the cross, but I do think it is imp- important to appreciate that. I also want you to understand the power of the cross. So there are some things that the cross means for you, and I want to encourage you in this. First, the cross proves God loves you. Some of you might feel unloved and wonder if anyone really loves you. Maybe you've never experienced real love or you've gone through heartbreak recently or a feeling of rejection. Someone broke up with you, an employer laid you off or a family member abandoned you, stopped returning your calls. Many people have not yet experienced real love and you cannot until you experience the love of Jesus. First John 3 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life to die for us. The world says love is love. No, this is love. That Jesus laid down his life to die for us. And people will ask, you know, but does God really love me? Does God really love me? Especially if you're going through a hard time, you might start to question, like, how can I be going through this if God loves me? Romans 5.8 says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You realize Jesus said, in this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Just because you're going through a hard time doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. But what about when you sin? A lot of times when you sin, you start to wonder, does this lessen God's love for me? Because I'm breaking his commandments. I know I'm not doing the right thing. I'm sure he loves me less than he did before I sin. You got to get this straight. If Jesus loved you enough to die for you when you were still a sinner, what makes you think God would love you less when you're a son or a daughter? John 15 says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. This is what Jesus said to his disciples. I mean, you've maybe been loved really well by your spouse or by a child or a parent, but there is no greater love than the sacrificial love of Jesus. This is the greatest love in humanity, in the universe. Every other type of love is a lesser type of love that we only understand through the lens of God's love. Here's the next thing. First, the cross proves God loves you. Then the cross makes us guiltless. Sin creates a debt of guilt. Sin creates a spiritual stain. It creates a weight of shame. In fact, I remember the first time I watched the movie The Passion of the Christ, and as Jesus was suffering, I just felt this weight of guilt in my gut. Like all my muscles were just in a knot. That's the kind of shame and weight that we feel when we sin and we break God's laws. And that's why everyone really, I'd say most people in the world today, they are so desperate for someone to take the guilt away from them. Christians, we experience this through Jesus, but many people in the world today, they just look for someone to tell them that, well, your sin isn't actually a sin. And that the world is full of people today who will say, no, that's not a sin. That's normal. You're just doing what feels good. You're doing what's right for you. If it makes you feel good, then you should do it. Uh, who am I to judge you? If it's right for you, I'm sure it's a good thing. And they'll say, that, no, it's, you're having sex outside of marriage. Like, oh, that's normal. Everyone does that. You want to kill your own baby. That's your reproductive right. You're, you're violating God's design. Don't feel bad about it. Throw a parade for it. This is what people want to do rather than deal with the guilt of sin. There's only one way to remove guilt. When we try to excuse it, we are spitting in the face of Christ and the suffering that he went through for us. We can only remove guilt by having it removed for us 
This is what Jesus accomplished on the cross, that sin debt that we built up, a debt we could never repay, was paid by Jesus. When he said, it is finished in Greek in the scriptures, the word is tetelestai, is often the same word would be found on ancient banking documents when a loan had been paid in full. Tetelestai, paid in full. The debt is paid. And this is what Jesus did for you. Colossians 2, it said, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. The bill for your sin debt was paid in full by Jesus. It was nailed to the cross, marked paid in full by the blood of Christ. Just like you can tell the seriousness of a sin by the punishment prescribed, you can also tell the value of a thing by what people are willing to pay for it. And God was willing to buy your freedom with the life of his beloved son. How many of you would give up the life of your child to save someone else? The cross of Jesus shows you how bad of a sinner you are and how loving of a savior you have. And it proves how valuable you are to God. First Peter says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. So to those of you who maybe still carry the guilt or the shame of your past sins and mistakes, I need you to hear this. Jesus gave his blood to remove guilt from you, which is why you have no legal right to bring it back or cling to it. God has removed your guilt as far as the east is from the west, which means it's completely gone. He remembers it no more. There is nothing more powerful and precious than the blood of Christ, which is why you can never say, God couldn't forgive me. I couldn't be forgiven by God. What I did was too bad. Like you might have done some bad things, but the power of Jesus' blood is greater than the stain of your sin. So the cross makes us guiltless, and then the cross grants us peace with God. Jesus said, anyone who is not for me is against me. There's no neutrality in the kingdom of God. People think they can be neutral and and not be Christians. They don't have to be believers. But a lot of people, they're, they're not Christians, yet they'll say positive things about Jesus. Like, he was really admirable. He was a good man. He taught us to be kind. And I really appreciate a lot of his teaching They think they're in a status of neutrality when really they're in a place of enmity. Every single person either stands with the Son of God or with Satan. And who you're standing with when your life ends determines who you spend eternity with. Either with Jesus in the glories of heaven or with Satan in the fires of hell. There is no way to get on God's side except through the cross. The only way to remove bad blood between you and God is through Christ's blood. Colossians says, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Through the blood of Jesus, we have peace with God. And the cross changes our relationship dynamics from enemy to family from rebel to reconciled, from sinner to saint, from hostility to holy. Then this, the cross requires worship from us. When Jesus was beaten and mocked by those soldiers before his crucifixion, think about what they were doing. They were mocking his royal status, put put that scarlet robe around him and put a crown of thorns on his head and, oh, hail King Jesus. They're bowing down to him, you know, raising their hands. Oh, hail the king as they beat him and tortured him. These people had no idea who they were messing with. In his suffering, Jesus allowed this shameful display to take place. Today, many still mock him. Think about how many people mock God in our culture. And laugh at what God says. They mock his word. They mock his people. But there will come a day of reckoning. Revelation 19 talks about another type of scene. Where Jesus will reappear in his full glory. Describes him coming on a white horse. Robed in white. And his robe will be dipped in the blood of his enemies. 
Instead of a crown of thorn, he'll have a crown of gold. Instead of people spitting on him, he'll be wiping the tears from our eyes. Instead of mocking cries, hail King Jesus, we'll hear the sound of heaven's armies crying out, hail Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I want to ask you to think about those mocking soldiers next time we worship Jesus. Don't worship weaker than mockers mock. These mockers went all out to mock Jesus. They put a whole show on. They bowed down. They praised him. They cried out, hail King Jesus. They got him a robe and a crown. They put a lot of effort into it. A lot more effort than I see some Christians put into worshiping Jesus at church on Sundays. I would just ask you to think about this next time you're in church and you're like, I don't really feel like singing. I'm sipping my coffee. I'm kind of bored. Remember what Jesus went through for you. Remember the image of Jesus being ripped to shred, being mocked by haters for you. And then don't respond based on how you feel, but based on what you know. You know that Jesus suffered for you because he loves you and he deserves worship from you. Our cries of worship should be louder than the cries of mockers. Praise and worship isn't something that you do just when the music moves you, but it's something that God deserves because of what Jesus already did for you. And knowing what he went through, how, how can we not feel like worshiping him? I know we don't base all of our faith just on feelings. That would be dangerous but we cannot divorce feelings from our faith because feelings come out of the soul. And when your spirit and soul has been renewed by the Holy Spirit, you start to feel something, you start to feel love. I honestly, I get concerned as a pastor for Christians who don't feel anything for Jesus. They don't feel any love for Jesus. You cannot question the love of Jesus. The question is, do you love Jesus? Only you can answer that question. Do you love Jesus? Maybe you do, but you haven't been showing it. Maybe you do, but you haven't been living like it. I'm going to close with this. I want you just to think about when Jesus was hung on the cross, the Bible says that there were two criminals crucified beside him. These criminals were condemned for crimes they had actually committed. They were guilty. And Matthew tells us that they mocked Jesus. They both mocked him. But then during that six hours while Jesus was there on the cross, one of the criminals had a change of heart. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To this criminal, Jesus said, very, very truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Although he was guilty of a crime and he had just been mocking Jesus. Now here he was near death, crying out to God for mercy and receiving salvation. This is the mercy of God. This is the love of God of God on full display. On the other side of Jesus was another criminal who died mocking the Son of God and died in his sins apart from God. These two criminals, you realize, are really like a microcosm for all of humanity. Every single one of us has committed crimes against God. We all deserve death. Many people mock God And what Jesus has done for them, dying in a state of separation from God. While others of us who are believers in Jesus, despite the fact that we are guilty, recognize Jesus is the way. And we cry out, Lord, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. And we experience the grace of God. You realize that second criminal who cried out for mercy, he was nailed to the cross, a criminal, but he died a son of God. Which kind of criminal are you going to be? Because you've done the crime. The question is, will you call out to God for mercy or will you die in a state of mockery? That's the question that every person has to wrestle with. What am I going to do? And I want to take a moment to address that. In a moment, we're going to take communion. We're going to sing about Jesus' suffering on the cross, which he definitely deserves our praise and worship. But first, let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes for a moment. And this might be an opportunity for someone to place their faith in Jesus and receive salvation for the first time. And so I want to lead you in prayer. And I would just ask you if you 
mean this, if you're ready to accept the mercy of God, then pray this with me. And if you mean it in your heart, God will hear you and respond to you. I'm just going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to ask you just to repeat it after me. In fact, I'm going to ask the whole church at all of our campuses, just repeat this after me wherever you're at. And we're just going to pray this all together. For some of you, it might be the first time or it might be the first time you ever really meant it. Let's pray this together. Say, dear God, I have sinned against you and I need forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose again. I ask for Jesus' forgiveness and I believe in his resurrection. I thank you for loving me. I ask you to lead me as your child from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's keep our heads bowed just for a moment. And if you just prayed that prayer for the first time or you just meant it for the first time, will you just slip a hand up between you and God? We just want to give you a Bible to help you in your new walk with God. If that's you, you can just raise a hand and one of our team members will bring one to you at any location. Praise God. All right, hey, let's stand to our feet, church. We're going to take communion together now. And you can grab that communion serving as you stand. This is something any Christian is welcome to do. And the Bible tells us before we take communion, we should examine ourselves and confess any sin to God that might be present in our lives. But if you're a Christian, I would invite you to participate in this. Communion is really about remembering the blood that Jesus shed and what it means for us. In 1 Corinthians 11, it says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake of the cup. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice and the fellowship that we have with you. We thank you for what you've accomplished for us on the cross, that you shed your blood for us and that your blood washes us white as snow. It removes the stain of sin and purchases our freedom. We thank you for what you went through for us, Jesus. And we celebrate that you didn't just die for us, but you conquered the grave and rose you arose again. Lord, we give you the praise and worship that you deserve and we will testify of your goodness until we see you again face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone say Amen. Let's worship Jesus. Let's give him the glory that he deserves today. Come on.